remotely with the Board of Education. The reason this uh, meeting is taking place remotely is due to COVID-19. Uh, at this time, we are starting the presentation with our president, Ms. Pamela Stroll. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to call the meeting to order. So please join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you for that. Uh, we will move right into our agenda with item two and the budget presentation. Ms. Katie Bizzetti, please take it away. Good evening, everyone. Let me just share my screen here. And while Katie is getting ready for the audience, uh, all the board members are still here. You will see them to the right. You will not see all of them because it can only handle five at a time. But throughout the meeting, our technical director will be uh, scrolling and showing you different views of the different board members, but they are all still here. So just as an interest of transparency, this is so everybody can also see the presentation while Ms. Bazzetti walks the board through it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming together tonight. Um, we are operating under a, a, a new, very tight time frame, um, given recent updates from the governor's office. Um, so two things going on here between the budget and the vote. Um, so the schools are dismissed, um, as we know, now through the end of the year. Um, so we are continuing to work through that in our online learning with our students. Um, from a budget perspective, um, <clears throat> His final proposal um, held all foundation aid flat at our 1920 foundation aid levels. So for us, that meant a decrease of what we were expecting of $96,000. Um, in addition to reverting our foundation aid back to 1920 levels, there was also essentially a swap of money between state aid um, with the federal uh, stimulus money. So $1.1 billion of state aid to schools was replaced with this federal assistance aid um, what they're calling a pandemic adjustment. So what that means for us is $548,000 in what we're expecting from state aid has been reduced and we're now getting that, that same dollar for dollar shift to federal money. Um, there's a different process in place for that. We, while it's, it's allocated for us because it's federal dollars, there's still an application process, there's still an expense tracking process, and there'll be a reporting process. So. Um, not quite as um, free as our typical foundation aid is, but we did get that dollar for dollar swap. Um, also included in his final budget, there are four adjustment periods where he can um, evaluate the state's own current budget status and adjust the budgets for state agencies like schools, fire, police, um, hospitals, things like that that are dependent on state dollars. And we may see adjustments to our own funding at these four measurement points during the year. The first one, we just passed the first one on April 30th. We haven't heard or seen anything yet on what that impact will be for April 30th. I know there's some, some big pushes about federal assistance and if they receive that federal assistance, um, schools, hospitals, state agencies, things like that will we'll remain whole. Um, but that's not in play right now. It sounds like that may not happen until over summer. So the first measurement period was April 30th. We're waiting to hear the impact on that. The next one is June 30th. The next one, December 31st. The final one, March 31st. So we have these four points in the air where we were kind of in flux, not knowing where our state aid is going to land. And then most recently, our, our budget vote and board of elections has been determined to be held on June 9th by absentee ballot only. Uh, which is why we're here tonight to um, talk about the budget, get some final guidance. So we have time to communicate with our, with our, our public, our budget, um, in time for the mailing of these absentee ballots. So a very condensed time frame um, that we're working on because of this June 9th absentee ballot requirement. So just a reminder of our tax levy, um, the inflation rate 
this year was 1.81. That's set by the Office of the State Comptroller. The tax base growth factor is 1.0175, set by the state. Um, two of the big factors that play into the calculation of our tax levy. Just a reminder to everyone, um, you know, because this, this tax cap calculation often is called the 2% tax cap. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that that 2% is just this one item, the allowable levy growth factor. That is the factor in this that can never go above the 2%. It was 2% last year, a little bit less this year. But all the other factors that go into play in this calculation, as it did this year, can go above um, that quote unquote that 2% and still be within the law um, as it's required to be calculated. So for us this year, if we as we discussed, the allowable, maximum allowable levy that we could potentially go out with for next year is 6.76%. This is something that we continue to talk about um, quite heavily each year to, to show everyone, to illustrate how our levy increase and how our tax rate increase have, have played um, against each other or with each other throughout the years. Um, and you'll see Historically, back to 2003, our tax rate has been very consistent um, in that $17, $18 range. Um, we've had some years that's gone up, we've had some years that's gone back down. Um, but overall, it's, it's been a very consistent um, rate. We're very fortunate in our district, as we all know, that we continue to see growth of assessments uh, with new construction and the valuation um, within our district um, that we're fortunate to maintain steady levels, if not increasing levels of assessments. And again, as a comparison to our, our neighboring districts, our rate is quite favorable compared to what the other uh, tax rates are. So here's our final overview of our state aid. Um, so as I said before, our foundation aid was kept flat with 1920, but we did have that decrease of the pandemic adjustment. So you'll see the out coming in from foundation aid and that adjustment at the bottom for the federal pandemic adjustment. The impact, you know, is going to have, you know, longer lasting implications for the district, not just for 2021. With the replacement, the decrease of those state dollars with the federal dollars, um, in order to see any increase in state aid going forward, he has to make up that 1.1 billion that was reduced in state dollars. So we could be seeing, you know, some tight foundation aid years going forward until they're able to overcome, you know, what was cut and before they can even begin increasing school aid as they wanted. Um, so we saw this adjustment this year with this federal pandemic adjustment to kind of even things out, but the future years will be, will be challenging while they begin to somehow replenish that state aid that was reduced this year. So overall, um, with all things considered, our building aid decrease, post these aid increase in a decrease in our excess cost aid, our total State aid did have a decrease of $238,000 or 0.7%. So since we last talked, this is, these are the adjustments that have been made to the revenue um, side of the budget. As I said, the foundation aid had to be reduced. Um, the community schools proposal that we would receive $99,000 did not make it into the final budget. So that's been removed. Um, some miscellaneous revenue adjustments of about $8,000 and also a small decrease in instructional materials aid, which is our textbook, software, hardware, library money that we get a dollar for dollar aid reimbursement for. Um, it's all told that brings our revenues down to just under $77 million. With all other revenues um, in the budget, we're at 76,965. And then flip side, adjust Adjustments that have been made to the budget side, um, the expense side of the budget, again, community schools has been removed in expense since we've lost that revenue. Um, additional salary adjustments with some additional retirements that have been notified, uh, both these adjustments and a corresponding decrease to ERS, TRS, and Social Security because of the salary adjustments. Bringing the total budget down to 81,723. Here's the current status of our budgeted expenditures as they stand today. 
Um, salary expenditures of 4% increase, primarily all due to contractual obligations. Benefits, um, small change, but remember this does not include any increase to our health claims. This is just to manage um, all the other expenses related to our benefits categories. That service has gone up. Um, we are continuing to add uh, bus borrowings to our budget until we hit that full five-year cycle. We're heading into year four, so there's an additional bus borrowing budgeted for 2021, as well as an increase in our debt service as we continue to ramp up our borrowing for our, our 94 million capital project. Uh, both these services, uh, we talked about some of those decreases at the last meeting, but now that we have our final both these numbers, uh, we have reduced our budget by $525,000. Uh, the other ones are pretty minor. So again, so total budget um, increase at this point of $1.81 million or 2.28. So with all these adjustments combined, our adjusted gap is 4.7 million. We'll continue to talk tonight about the remaining tools we still have left. Um, state aid is obviously um, out of the picture at this point, if not going in the other direction. So as we talked at the last meeting, um, presented what, what our budget would look like if we continue to use our same level of reserves and fund balance as we have in the past. Uh, so for 1920, we appropriated a 438,000 in ERS, 50,000 from our employee benefits reserve, 12,000 from unemployment, and our continued 2 million in fund balance. So using those tools into 2021, as we did in 1920, would bring our gap down to 2.1 million. We wanted to bring back um, to the discussion the considerations that we talked about during uh, the budget development season this year. Um, they're all in their own rights items of health and safety. Um, nothing to be taken lightly, all things to be considered. Um, so in, in our continued discussions and, and how we want this budget to continue to be built, um, we added those back in, our gap with them in is 2.3. And we can have discussions about those later, but we put them in for now. There's not many this year. Um, and again, they, they all are important in their own right. So we wanted to make sure we did our due diligence and to continue to talk about them. Katie, it would be also important to note that although these are here, one of the things the district would do in light of the uncertain times is we would hold any of these going into position until we know our final budget position once the governor um, makes any potential reductions <laughs> as these would be tools that could be utilized to try to meet uh, the reductions also and not necessarily try to dip into the human side of reductions as we go forward with the unknown. Thank you, yes, that is absolutely correct that while they would be in there for, upon approval, um, that by no means obligates us to purchase them at any point in time, we can wait and see where things end up um, before we make these actual purchases. So with this information, um, just want to talk about some options we have available, different tools we have available to us, and how um, they impact the, the full picture of, of all the moving pieces we have when trying to build this budget. So based on our current levy, if we went out at the full 6.76%, that's a total levy of 41 million 47, which is an increase of 2.6. This, that calculation includes the use of carryover of 364,000, which is the maximum amount of carryover per the calculation that we're allowed to use. So with all those pieces, with, with the budget picture we've presented using the same level of fund balance and reserves, that does create a budget surplus of $290,000. So that does two things. One, if everything goes well, um, we haven't addressed health claims yet. So this money could be allocated towards health claims. If we find that things are going the other way, the surplus is a tool to, to react to if we find a loss in our state aid. Based on the 
the, um, excuse me, the assessment estimates I currently have from the county using this, um, this levy information, the, the range of where our tax rate could be at this point in time is a minimum of 1.73 or $31,000 or, or $31, excuse me, per $100,000 assessment or 3.84% or $69 on a $100,000 full value assessment. Again, that's based on the information received today as far as equalization rates and assessments. Um, we're continuing to watch those closely, um, but based on the information today, that's, that's the impact on the tax rate of this, this levy at 6.76%. So now let's look at if we used a portion of our debt service reserve. So all things remaining equal, if we allocated 375,987 of our debt service reserve, I know that's a very specific number. That is the amount of premiums that we received on our past bus borrowings and capital project borrowings, as well as any remaining balance of unspent funds of those borrowings. So if we apply the 375 in debt service, what that does is it brings the levy down. Um, we're, we're, it goes in that capital exclusion piece to offset our debt. Um, so it brings the levy down. So a use of 375,000 of debt service reserve would result in a levy decrease of 5.8. The total levy would be 41,111 or $2.2 million over last year. The surplus though would remain the same at the 290,000. We're just essentially, um, it's a trade off of where the money comes from. So instead of that full amount coming from the taxpayer levy, a portion of that, the 375, is going to come from our reserves. So we're using our own savings to bring that levy down. By bringing the levy down, the tax rate is also projected to go down. Um, so the minimum would be 0.81 or $15 on a $100,000 full assessment, or 2.9% or $52 on a $100,000 full assessment. Scenario two is still the use of debt service, but let's use a little bit more and see what it does. So in this scenario, it uses $550,000. So again, it's that trade-off of $550,000 coming from the levy and coming from our savings, which means the budget surplus still remains the same at that $290,000. Our, our cash in hand is still the same. By bumping it up to $550,000, our levy increase goes down to 5.3%, uh, 40,937, or an increase over last year of 2,078. But again, we still have the same cash because we're pulling that 550 from that debt service reserve. The impact on the tax rate, again, further brings it down because that levy is less. Um, so minimum would be 0.38% or $7 on a $100,000 full assessment or 2.46% or $44 on a $100,000 full assessment. Then the scenario three, it, it takes a piece of debt service and it takes a piece of looking at that carryover. So this scenario increases our debt service reserve up to 625,000, brings the carryover down from the 364 down to 300,000. And you'll see that gets us down to below 5% at 4.98. Total levy would be 40,792, an increase of 1.9 million over the year prior. It does bring the budget surplus down some because we are losing that 64,000 from the budget carryover. Um, but it's only $64,000 different from the previous scenarios that we've looked at. Um, so again, the impact for the tax rate, the tax rate continues to go down as we draw that levy down. Um, so in this one, uh, minimum, it, you know, it's projected at this point to remain fairly flat, 0.02%. Um, maximum increase, uh, 2.09% or $38. So here's a summary um, of all those scenarios next to each other so you can kind of track uh, the impact um, across each one. Um, but again, that use of debt service, um, you know, meets the spirit of, of what I think we we're trying to accomplish where we recognize that we, we need that money to support our budget um, and to support our contractual obligations in our budget. Um, but the levy increase based on the calculation, you know, felt too high. Uh, so this is a way to, you know, meet in the middle, still meet our cash flow needs, um, 
but bring that levy increase down. So at this point, um, we can open it up to the board for discussion. I'd be happy to answer any questions on these scenarios, um, but looking for some, some guidance and some feedback from the board on, on how you'd like us to finish building the budget for this year. Katie, because it will be a discussion of the board, we will need you to unshare. Okay. Um, this has been sent to each of the board members so that they have it in their email so they can talk. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, because we're all muted when you, Pam is unmuted, when she calls upon you, just raise your hand, we'll look at it or just unmute and We'll be here, Katie, myself, to answer questions. Okay, so who has a comment or a question? Dan? You have to unmute, Dan. Okay, I just had a question, Katie, in regard to that last scenario, the, uh, you talked about the reduction of the budget surplus by about $64,000. And can you explain, is that required because of the other pieces of the scenario or, or why in, in that case would we be using less, why does that go down? Can you explain that please? Katie, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. Um, the purpose of that scenario was to show the board uh, what it would look like if we did reduce that carryover and what the impact would be. Um, it does bring down the levy, um, but it is um, less cash on hand um, if we don't use the full carryover. So we wanted the board to um, see that it is an option, certainly to um, reduce that carryover depending on where um, the board wants this direction to go. Um, but it's simply an illustration so you could see, you know, what it means if we did use that carryover as a tool. Okay, can I ask a follow-up? I just, maybe I'm not yeah. getting it. But I understand what you're saying. It's kind of like moving different. Mm -hmm. But if we're, if we don't include that money in the carryover there, where, do, where, is, where is that money elsewhere in scenario three? Because I'm thinking of it like it's there, yeah. you know, so we're not bringing it over as part of the carryover. What happens to it? It's, it's lost. Yeah. So the calculation of a carryover um, is calculated. Um, it's a specific formula of how much carryover we're entitled to each year. If we don't levy the full amount the prior year, uh, we have the option to utilize the full amount of the carryover, which is that 364,000. We have the option to use a lesser amount. We have an option to use none of it. If we go with a lesser amount or use none of it, it's just gone. It, there, it, the carryover doesn't continue to carry over. It resets each year based on the calculation. Is there any advantage to using less than all of it? Why wouldn't we just use all of it in scenario three and have a higher surplus? certainly an option. Um, in scenario three, if we were to add that back in, it does kick the, um, the levy percentage up. Um, so that's, that's the balance of the calculation is the carryover comes down, the levy comes down, put the carryover back in or increase the carryover, the levy percentage goes up. But it certainly can go all back in. Yes, and if I can add, Dan, that's one of the things, like as you saw, at first we were working with the debt service, we worked a little more with the debt service. We got the debt service in option three to really the maximum we feel we would be comfortable in using because we used 580 last time. And it was tough when you come off of it the next year. So we are looking at using that 625. That's what we believe should be the maximum. And to bring down the levy, which was one of the directions of the board, the only other way we could do that is to shorten the amount of carryover that we have. So it's just a, it's like a teeter totter. It's a balancing between the two points. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I think I'm tracking now.
Other questions, comments? Marianne? You have to unmute, Marianne. Go ahead and push your space bar and hold it okay, down. Okay, I think I'm there good. You go. <laughs> um, just, a, you know, kind of a general comment after listening to Katie, and thank you, Katie, for all your hard work. Um, you know, the um, uncertainty of the years ahead, uh, not really knowing what's going to happen, I think we just need to be really cautious about, you know, where we go. Um, I'm not going to say particularly which budget is better than the other, but I do think we need to uh, be very cautious because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. It's not certainly going to be just this year, but as you said, Katie, in years to come, we just don't know where we're going to be and what kind of aid we're going to get and so forth. So other questions, comments from anyone? We're gonna to have to provide some guidance as well. Dan? So I don't wanna monopolize the conversation, but I had a follow-up. So and uh, Dr. Douglas, you alluded to this, but in the use of pushing the use of the debt service reserve to essentially as far as you felt comfortable, I mean, is it is it the view of the administration that that the impact of using that 625 is is something that district, do you feel like that puts us in any kind of a compromised position financially? Is there any risk to Marianne's point, you know, down the road that you foresee from that? Because I think, I mean, I, you certainly heard us in the last meeting and, and in my mind, seeing the levy around that 5% kind of number feels like something that we could, we could um, hopefully be successful with in in the vote and it enables us to you know maintain and not cut which is all positive but i'm wondering do you see any significant risk from the use of the reserves at that elevated level uh, katie and i have both talked about it i mean we started at the 550 knowing that we had 580 and when we got the 580 it just wouldn't get it to where we needed i, I will tell you we're hoping that as we've done every year with our trend that if we went out at the option three and the numbers come back typical to the trend, we would be on the lower end of that rate, which would be close to zero, which that's what we were trying to target for the community. But on top of it, it gives the possibility that it could also go to a negative as well. Uh, and it's still much better than last year's budget that we proposed. So we didn't really wanna be above 625, we feel we could do that and we could feel that the next year if we had to step off or use the same, we still have those tools, but we can't do it forever. And we also have to have a game plan to remove it, not just all in one year, preferably. So the debt service reserve does have a, a, a decent balance that it can support um, the use of the 625 um, for the 2021 budget. Um, as well as if we needed to come up with a phased approach to begin stepping it off out of our budget and replacing it with other funding sources, um, it's the balance is sufficient to support that as well. Christine? Um, I just have a question. So again, Katie, great, uh, great information. Thank you for putting together those scenarios. Um, do we understand, you know, the impact? So let's just say we have to go, we have to start the um, school year next year remotely. So are there added expenses that we don't, that we wouldn't realize until we get into that situation? I mean, obviously we know what the past two months have been like, um, but you know, what would that do if we had to start, if we had to start the school year remotely and what extra expenses would we have to consider? Yep, I, I'll take a crack at that and then I might have Tony um, step in and, and add his opinion. Um, but with the onset of it now, um, there's things we had to put in place now in order for our online learning uh, to be successful um, with our students out in the community. So we're bearing a lot of that expense now. Um, 
certainly, you know, things can change. Um, there, there'll always be something maybe new or better that we can explore. Um, but we've already had to, you know, explore other ways of reaching, um, of expanding, you know, the, the Wi-Fi access and the technology in the hands of all of our students. Um, so we've overcome that hurdle and we, we realize we can do it. Um, next year, Tony, is there anything new you see on the horizon that may be coming? It's a, it's a great question. I, you know, as we've moved along, we've been able to shuffle uh, appropriate money just with an instructional to cover the, you know, where we thought we might have spent it in one spot. Not don't need that in that resource anymore because of the current circumstances and able to move it over to uh, another. I see professional learning costs and things like that being a, on the on the horizon, but I think that we just we have to reallocate given circumstances. But I don't want to put it up. There's beyond that's just the instructional. Operational might be a different story. And I think Tom or Katie probably talk more to that operational side. But from the instructional, just might be some shifting. But a good question that we'll keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I think Tony, you you hit it right there. Is first of all, we don't know what the structure is yet that we will come back to. And we may have multiple school days during the day is one of the conversations. Uh, but most importantly, on the operational side, we have to adhere to potential social distancing, cleaning, safety protocols, face PPE, and everything else. So there will be additional costs no matter what. Uh, we just don't know what the scope and size of those costs are going to be. Uh, it's just like right now, do we have one-to-one -one for every child? No, we don't. One of the things we are probably going to have to consider doing is talking like we do with calculators and asking our parents if they're thinking about a purchase, keep certain things in mind to help with that 101. I mean, one-to-one -one computer uh, technology so that we can support those that really have no way of doing it. But those are all things that are unanticipated right now, but we know there's potential for them. So that's aligned with if we come back. Back to Christine's earlier point, but slightly differently. So let's, if we were to have to continue um, distance learning in the fall, are there savings we would realize? Transportation or um, some utilities, I don't know. The, the thing yeah. is, is I believe there's, there's, as the governor said, there's savings that will incur, but there's gonna be additional expenses that we have no, no choice in. Uh, the problem with the transportation is kind of twofold. And we, I, I along with Joe Rumsey uh, from Bath, co-wrote a letter for the legislature to try to hold transportation aid harmless. Because right now we face a major cut in transportation aid because yes, we may have saved money this year, but because we saved it, there will be no aid next year, which means we don't stop our transportation. Now we'll have to fully fund it for at least one year until the budget recovers that aid two years out. So that's the hard part. Anything aidable, we wanna make sure we try to incur as much expense as possible. Okay, other questions, comments, Doug? Um, I think um, out of the three options that were presented, I'm most comfortable with uh, such a scenario three. Um, the overall levy increase is still on the high side for me, but I think um, the high end of the tax rate, the possible tax rate, is something that I, I think I can live with and defend and talk to the taxpayers. And it seems like it doesn't have that much to drive. There's not, I would say, there's not a ton of difference between the three scenarios. And so that, that out of the three is the most powerful. Okay, so Doug, you're a little difficulty here, but if I understood the summary of that in general, you're most comfortable with scenario three. Okay, thank you. Brian? I, I would agree with Doug. You know, kind of looking at the numbers, they're all very close. Um, I like scenario three because the, the the numbers to the taxpayer keeps it pretty minimal and there could be a chance there's no increase, which I think is great, you know, kind of given the economy. 
plus I do like in the budget development, I do like the fact that there's some, uh, you know, health and safety factors that they built in with the buses, you know, and things like that. So I'm glad a few items did make it into the list this year. I think they're necessary and I'm glad they're included, but I would, I would support uh, number three also. It comes in under 5%, but the um, kind of the expected increase would be, you know, close to zero, which would be tremendous. So I would lean towards three also. All right, anyone else? Warren, let's hear from you then, Dan. Um, I'm good with three, if that seems to be where we're heading. Uh, as everybody has already indicated, it's um, the most palatable towards the taxpayer, and it still gets us uh, a workable budget. So I'm good there. Thank you. Dan? Thank you. I, uh, I'm i also supportive of three I, of, of the scenarios presented. I like that the best. Uh, and I agree with Brian. I think that, you know, the, the budget considerations, they're all positive from a health and safety perspective. But, you know, if push came to shove, I would be in favor of, of you know, not spending $50,000 on, on the transportation truck as you know, we heard they can make it last for another year and using that for, say, an educational purpose if we had to. So I just wanted to go back to make sure I understood the comment um, in the presentation was that, like, if we have that in the budget for that item, but until we purchase, I think there was, you know, the comment was along the lines of, like, we're not required to, we could theoretically move that money over to pay for an, an educational purpose, uh, we'd have that flexibility. I wanted to confirm that. Yes, that we can budget for the item um, with the intent that we're gonna buy it if, if the state budget works out. If we find we're in a tough state aid crunch and um, we're starting to make those decisions about how we can make ends meet, it would not be a purchase that would have to be made. And, and basically, Dan, so that you know, we would hold off on any of our major purchases along this line until very late in the year, probably after the new year before, really after the third point where the governor could cut the budget, because the fourth one is when they have to do a new budget. And we don't believe the legislature or the governor would cut at that point just to establish a new budget a day later. Okay, that's helpful. And that would be my, you know, given the risk as the year develops and the possibility of impacts we can't anticipate right now, I would feel it would be, a, I, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable with us buying a shiny new truck if we had to make some other cut. I understand the intent is, right, that we would get it, but I, the fact that we have that flexibility if something, un, you know, happens as part of those, um, periods of, of possible change, then, then I'm comfortable with the idea of including those. And I do like three of the options. So thank you. Shayla, how about you? Um, I like three, but um, two also looks good. And what is the major difference between two and three? Like how, how much of a tight crunch is there in difference? Um, so the difference from a budget perspective, um, the surplus, goes down $64,000 in um, scenario three. So $64,000 less essentially in cash flow. Um, the levy is a little higher. So scenario three, 4.98, it goes up to 5.35, um, which increases the, the potential tax rate for the taxpayer. If that levy is higher, it increases the potential tax rate. Um, so a little bit of a, you know, twofold. So a little bit of a decrease in our budget as far as money coming in and a little bit of an increase to the taxpayer uh, by way of tax rate, potentially. Marianne, how about you in terms of scenarios? Um, I, I could go with scenario three. I could support that one. Christine? 
Um, I, you know, I, I would also be supportive of scenario three. Um, I'm also not opposed to scenario two either. I think, um, you know, it would still be, you know, at, at the minimum increase, it would still be very low. And, you know, we all know that these numbers are always very conservative and, and they usually come in lower than what we usually plan for. Um, you know, but so I would, I would be supportive of either one, but if the majority is, is focused on three, then I'm fine with that. Thank you. So I agree with uh, Christine and Shayla. I certainly support three, but if we found we had to go to two, um, I could support that as well. Well, if that, that's what we're hearing from the board, uh, the administration certainly could work with either one, two or three. But for the difference of, a, I think it's about $60,000, I would strongly recommend the board to give us the go ahead and option three. The reason being is we, you know, as we were trying to put this together, we're hoping that our numbers come on that aggressive side and even better in August, that we might see a negative and below, be below that zero. One is because of the time, but two, is to because if, if we can keep this trend going, especially knowing where the rate and what the rate does, we feel that next year is going to be the really harder year. And we wanna to try to put ourselves in line again. And if possible, if it does come back negative, this is one of the things that I'm proud that the board can say over 15 years, but I can say over five, the tax rate has not gone up since I've been here and also has not gone up for over 15 years from the high at that point. So I think that's really something we need to resonate with our community and I hope they realize that. Okay, so Katie, Tom, you have what you need? We will prepare the budget at those option three number. Now the hard part is, and I'm sorry I have to ask you to do this, but we will need to do a remote uh, Board of Education meeting Thursday morning at 7.30. And the reason why we need that is because we've got to start with our absentee ballots and get them in the mail, uh, as well as we must have our newsletter done. And that has to be done Thursday so it can be to the printer, so it can coordinate and get hopefully home before the absentee ballots. So people have the direct information they can re read and look at and then make an informed decision on voting. So we just wanted to let you know that that's what we are doing. Uh, is the board okay with that Thursday morning at 7.30? And then we'll have a quick agenda meeting right after the meeting for the 21st Board of Education meeting. So is everyone okay with 7.30 Thursday morning? No problem with me. Works for me. All right, I think we have everybody. Okay, we will send out a Zoom meeting tomorrow morning for that. We will prepare the board meeting and the board agenda so that we have it and get that advertised. That should be a relatively quick meeting where we will give the brief overview of the presentation and ask for you to approve uh, the adopted budget for the vote. Okay. So on to item three, approval of the legal notice. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, any additional questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? I'm sorry, I dropped out on, on there right before you announced the resolution. What, what? The um, legal notice. Oh, okay. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Doug. Okay. And I have one more announcement, Pam, after that, before you are cleared to adjourn. Uh, today was the deadline for filing for Board of Education applications for running for the board. Uh, we did have a resignation of a board member prior to the annual elections closing. And that would mean that we actually have four seats on the ballot. 
Now, the three top seat vote getters, what the top three vote receivers would get the three-year terms, and the fourth individual would be able to fill a one-year term until the next election. Uh, because of that, uh, and I think the seat is up, uh, I just wanted to let the board know there are four candidates that put in. They will be run by alphabetical order, with the first being Mr. Tom Casey, the second being Mr. Warren Conklin, the third being Mr. Brian Lynch, and the fourth being Dr. Zebulon Raymond. Okay, is that all that you have? Yes, just making a public announcement now that we have the order of the ballot. Okay, so the last thing I had is I wanted to wish uh, Shayla and all of our school nurses a happy Nurse Appreciation Week, even though I think it ends uh, tomorrow. Thank you for especially all that you do every day, but the extra work that you're doing in these times that we find ourselves in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All right, thank you everyone. We will see you on Thursday morning. Thank, thank you. you. This concludes our Board of Education meeting. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.